Well, good morning. Welcome to Life Steps class for Sunday, the 10th of January, 2021. What a year it has been so far. Today, we're going to look at the remarkable second half of verse 8 of Psalm 34, and today's video will be about 10 to 12 minutes. We will take a moment at the end of the class and say a prayer for our beloved America. But before we do any of that, Let's get started by asking the Lord for wisdom as we open his word. Lord, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, today we consider the Lord as our refuge, which really leads to being the Lord as our peace, our place of rest. How good that sounds right now, doesn't it? Peace, rest, refuge. Well, the big question before we get started is, where do you go for peace and for safety and for refuge? Where do you, um, do you actually know beyond any doubt that you will be received and find security to be exactly who and what you are, really, with no pretense and uh, no games, no play acting, a place where you can find rest, solace, healing of wounds, and a time to regain your strength? What do you do for that? Well, it seems in this psalm, and we've studied the background of the psalm a little bit, that David needed such a place during his seemingly unending flight from Saul. Do you know how hard it would be to flee from the king who wanted to kill you? The king has eyes and ears everywhere. Anybody fleeing from the king would never be able to sleep well. He wouldn't be able to trust his companions. He would always be looking over his shoulder. No peace, no rest, no refuge. So the remarkable thing about today's verse is that the Lord himself is the place of safety, which the believer can flee to. It's not a, it's not a cave and it's not a castle. It's the Lord himself, the person of the Lord himself. He is the refuge for his believers. And our verse today says, the one who takes refuge in him is going to be blessed. That is, the person who tastes and sees that the Lord is good will be further blessed when they run to him for shelter. Now let's turn to the verse. It's Psalm 34, verse 8. This is the second half of the verse today. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. The complete Jewish Bible says, how blessed are those who take refuge in him. And then different uh, translations put it a different way. The ESV says, take refuge. But the King James Version says, blessed are they who put their trust in him. And finally, the Good News Bible says, blessed are they Something like, blessed like that are they who find safety with him. Why the differences? Well, it arises from the Hebrew word, which is used here for refuge or to take refuge, and it is chosaw. It means to seek refuge, to flee for protection, and also, or to put trust, in this case, in God, to put trust in or confide in, again, in God here, and so it is translated both ways. So the translators would have had the discretion to use either approach, either a place of safety, a refuge, or it could be called um, it could be called a refuge, or it would be a um, the act of putting trust in a person. But the thing that makes take refuge the take refuge translation more meaningful to me is that when David chose the word, he was himself running and in need of shelter and of refuge. And the word refuge is further, uh, when we look at its own etymology, that's based on running because it comes from the Latin fugere, to flee. Now, we know that in, um, in the word fugitive, we understand that that denotes a man who is running from the law, often. A fugitive is a person who is running. So a refuge is a place, logically it follows, that you run to. And that's what it is, a place to run for safety as a shelter, a retreat, or a sanctuary. David by now understood that he must find shelter in God only. 
He has already said that the Lord is good, and he has tasted the Lord's goodness through the experience of his own trials. But now it continues to say that the man will be blessed who takes refuge in the Lord. There will be blessing in taking shelter in God. Well, uh, Andrew E. Hill, in his article in the um, Dictionary of Old Testament Theology, says, uh, figuratively, this this um, Hebrew word, chosaw, it means to place confidence in or to rely on someone. Hence, that's how the King James Version translates it, uh, put trust in. But still, apart from two exceptions, the word chosaw is used exclusively for seeking refuge in God. Here in the uh, Psalms, in Deuteronomy um, God is a rock, Deuteronomy 32, 37, a shield in Psalm 144, verse 2, and Proverbs 30, verse 5, and even a mothering bird. And we're going to get to, I think, an application of that, a mothering bird with outstretched wings, where a person takes refuge. Psalm 57, verse 1, and 61, verse 4. So the Lord can be trusted. In fact, it is better to seek refuge in God than in any human being. Let's face it, I think we know intuitively that that is true. It's better to seek refuge in God than in any human being, including in rulers. Even the people in authority and power and who have the wherewithal to really help, can we really trust them? Are they really trustworthy of our safety? It's hard to say that. Theologically, Kosaw emphasizes human insecurity and inability in the face of calamity and divine security and ability to harbor and preserve those in distress. So the verb denotes, you know, implies this, man is unable, God is able. We seek refuge, God is a refuge, okay? Two things, God is able to help, man is unable. At the, at the end of the day, man can't handle the trials that he faces, he must turn to God. Okay, refuge gives the defensive or external aspect of salvation. God, the unchanging, in whom we find shelter. Don't we want something that just always is going to be there, unchanging and sure and steady? And get this word, real. <laughs> Don't we yearn for that? The benefits of seeking refuge in Yahweh are far outweigh the momentary affliction of present circumstances in that those who find shelter in God are blessed with his favor. And those preceding comments came from the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, uh, Andrew E. Hill. The Psalms especially depict God as a refuge for the righteous. And this recognition of God as a shelter and haven in times of distress affirms the adequacy of Yahweh, the name for God, as a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. That is, covenant-making and covenant-keeping. God actually keeps the promises that he makes. And so we find parallel verses throughout Scripture, verses which emphasize this same point over and over again. Men, when they are in need and in trouble, find safety in God. God is trustworthy, and he will give rest and peace. And Jesus said this along the same lines. He said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Doesn't that sound good? Ye shall find rest unto your souls. Okay, now we'll look at a few of the parallel verses just to, uh, to shed a little more light on that. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because, because he trusteth in thee. And Psalm 11, verse 1, in the Lord I take refuge. Psalm 57, verse 1, and this is where we're going to see the image of the bird and its wings and the, and the, and the young bird taking refuge under the wings of its mother. Psalm 57, verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take shelter until the danger is past. What a description. That, that, what, what a description of God 
that the, the young bird would take refuge under the wings of its mother. Proverbs 16, verse 20, blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Well, this is what John Calvin said along these lines. He said, blessed is the man who trusts in him, for God never disappoints the expectations of those who seek his favor. He said, our own unbelief is the only impediment which prevents him from satisfying us largely and bountifully with abundance of all good things. J.H. Howlett said, What the Lord accomplishes for those who put their trust in him, he makes a new man of them. We become new men and women in Christ Jesus. Let's see what else I have here from the Benson Commentary. Christ is everywhere set forth here as an object of trust, not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old, see Isaiah 28, 16. And therefore they are most truly and fitly said to be blessed that put their trust in him. Well, you know, I think we can all agree on one thing. The storms of life can be awful. And in the end, if we're truthful now, in the end, there's no person or place where peace is actually assured in this life. To rely on people may be expecting more than they're really able to give. And Psalm 146, 3 through 5 says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. In the day of crisis, you may be treated to an excuse in the day of crisis, in the day of your real need. You may get an excuse from that person you turn to. There may be an unanswered message that you leave on an answering machine and wait in vain for a callback. But before we judge others, we have to remember that we ourselves are guilty of this too at times. For though men may have the best intentions, they're only human and fallible. The psalmist appealed instead to the Lord. He wrote Psalm 60 verse 11, give us help from trouble. That is, to the Lord, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of men. So who will be there, always and unchanging? The Lord will be there, and he will bless those who flee to him. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 27, verse 10, When my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. What a promise this is, one that we can hold on to for life. As Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 26, verse 4, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Well, that's all for today. Next week, Lord willing, we will continue with verse 9 of this precious psalm. And let's take a moment to pray for our country. Lord, we have inherited from you a wonderful and blessed land, and you've blessed us for these 200-some years. And now we seem to face a time of real trial in our national life. We confess that we have really turned away from you as a people, and we are guilty of much sin against you. As we come before you today, we pray, Lord, that you would, um, that you would hear our prayer for mercy. We can't pray to you on the basis of any merit of our own, but we appeal to your mercy. Oh Lord, don't give up on America. Oh God, come to our help. Oh God, we pray to you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.